Live. Welcome, everybody, to New Code Toronto uh, with the Biotosphere here at Aira. I'm Terry. And I'm Brian. And uh, we thank you for joining us here today live in Toronto, Canada. Uh, but there are many more people joining us uh, out on the interweb, uh, hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them that have tuned in, and uh, we're very excited to be here today. We're super thrilled to share with you all of the exciting things we've been working on at the Biotosphere, and to give you a teaser of what's to come. But before we go any further, we want to thank our hosts at AirUp and uh, share some info about what they do here. Yeah, so let's... Uh bring that up. So um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the amazing people at Arup who have embraced our vision and joined with us in uh, some of the, uh, the ideas that we think are going to shape the future. Um, for those of you who uh, are not aware of Arup, I am hearing a little bit of an echo. Um, they were founded in 1946 an independent firm of designers, engineers, architects, planners, consultants, and technical specialists working across every aspect of today's built environment. Arup has more than 14,000 specialists working on projects in more than 90 disciplines in over 34 countries. Uh, their digital services combine an innate knowledge of the built environment with new technologies to shape a better world. You can see why we like these guys so much. Arup is pioneering the use of the most advanced technologies to solve clients' complex problems. The built environment, delivery, operation, and service provision sectors are the last bastion of an old analog world. The sector is characterized by fragmentation, low margins, and unpredictable performance. Over the last five years, interventions by a number of governments have seen the first tentative steps in digitization through the use of building information modeling, BIM. Um, BIM has shown that it is possible to create useful structured data which describes brief design, manufacturing, and operational scenarios. However, the sector is limited by the existing data processing and exchange methods, which remain characterized by analog methods that support, and this is what I, I really love, um, they support old adversarial behaviors. And if we're going to change the world, it's not going to be by being adversarial. It's going to be through cooperation. Um, for the last two decades, the sector has tried to apply the collaboration mantra, but at the end of the day, when the chips are down, it's the contract that shapes behaviors and outcomes. So how does Arup move forward in this space? What is Arup's solution to complex data transactions where openness, transparency, honesty, and immutability are the basic foundations? I, I don't know. Um, Enter distributed ledger. With the promise of permanent, secure, and valuable transaction methodologies, for the first time, a technology has the potential to provide an effective solution. But how does Arup apply them? What are the challenges, and where has Arup started? Arup is exploring these areas and how they apply to the built environment from peer-to-peer -peer energy, transactions, and automatic contract execution to transportation and autonomous vehicles. As part of this exploration, Arup will be hosting our Biotosphere South location in their new digital lab currently being finished uh, to test proof of concepts and develop ideas with the end goal to fully transform the built environment into the digital age. So thank you guys. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to, uh, to be here today. Cool. So, you say you want a revolution. We all want to change the world. Most change takes a long time and comes as the result of incremental advances in technology, infrastructure, and social attitudes. The largest shifts in society come as the result of enough new infrastructure being built over long periods of time. Well, hey, Terry, you say you've got a real solution, but we'd all love to see the plan. 
plan? Plan? <laughs> we have a plan. And, um, you know, there's a lot of hype in the news today about distributed ledger, cryptocurrency, blockchain, ICOs. Um, they are going to make a big difference. And as with most hype, there's some truth, but there are a lot of broken promises. And that doesn't mean that there isn't something there. What we're missing now, at least as far as we're concerned, is some real world application that kind of leads to those aha moments where people who are not in the space suddenly understand how these technologies will impact their daily lives. One thing is for sure. The old ways of thinking certainly won't apply in the future. We need to turn those old business models on their heads. So let's look at an example that we're all familiar with. Um, well, most of us anyway, some of you won't even remember Blockbuster, but I grew up and, and my kids grew up with the Blockbuster empire. Our weekends, our holidays all revolved around Blockbuster, planning what we were going to watch. And any of you who have gone through that process of driving to the store, lining up for limited selection. You rent usually more than you need. You go home. The kids don't like what you picked. Your wife doesn't like what you picked. So you don't watch any of it. And then you go back only to find that you're paying late fees. You've rented much more than you wanted, and you've wasted a ton of time. Um, but the blockbuster empire felt like it would last forever. And then, of course, Netflix came along, and we all look back and we say, oh, it was obvious, but actually it took 21 years of infrastructure and scaffolding to create the Netflix we know and love today. And our friends at Arup know that you can't build a great edifice without making sure that you have a solid foundation first. So for Netflix to exist, they had to come up with things like the DVD because you couldn't ship five VHS tapes in an envelope. And then they needed uh, ubiquitous broadband streaming in the home and cellular service so that people could watch videos on their mobiles. And then they needed the big data analytics and the artificial intelligence that made it possible to do individual recommendations. And that didn't happen in a day. Blockbuster even had the chance to buy Netflix and turned it down. And you look at that now and you go, oh my God, like how could they have been so foolish? But you see it everywhere. People always call new technology a solution looking for a problem. And to be honest, distributed ledgers are no different. But without you even noticing, the change is starting to happen. One very telling example is Walmart, the largest retailer in the world. And they're already seeing value in implementing these solutions. They're requiring their suppliers to adopt them as well if they want to continue on as business partners. So one of the technologies that we are convinced will be the foundation of many of the new revolutions to come is IOTA. It's a unique third generation distributed ledger solution that goes well beyond blockchain and um, it uses a more um, innovative solution built on something called the directed acyclic graph, which in IOTA's case is called the tangle. There are no blocks, there are no chains, there are no miners, there are no mining transaction fees, and it's built for a protocol for the coming internet of things where machines will transact automatically and seamlessly with other machines, and um, the world will change as a result. IOTA is an open source protocol, and the nonprofit IOTA Foundation is already working closely with industry leaders like Bosch, Volkswagen, and Fujitsu, and is heavily involved in international initiatives around citizen identity in Taipei, Taiwan, as well as smart city initiatives in Europe. Not only is the IOTA Tangle scalable, 
It's specifically designed so that the proof of work required is within the capability of processors in all Internet of Things devices, from cars to thermostats, from dishwashers to elevators, from drones to traffic lights, and from ro routers to shipping containers. This means that it's a lightweight protocol that can become universal because every device and every sensor on the planet can participate in the IOTA tangle. Value transfer without fees means that true micropayments will only be practical with IOTA. To put this in perspective, last December, a single Bitcoin transaction cost in excess of, I think, $80 US in transaction fees. While fees have dropped, it seems unlikely that we'll be able to transact for one cent or a thousandth of a cent, let alone a millionth of a cent using those technologies. Because all IOTA transactions are fee-less, it's practical to just send data without any monetary component at all. That means 100% free and secure data transfer anywhere on the planet by design. So just like HTTP or TCP IP and HTTP created the foundation on which the internet that we know today was built, uh, IOTA and other peer-to-peer -peer protocols are going to build the solid foundation on which new applications that we can't even imagine are going to rise. So join us as we imagine the possibilities. Now our request for today is no matter what you've heard about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and criminality and money laundering, we actually request that you suspend all disbelief and just open yourself up to the possibility that there's something here that will change your life. And that there is the possibility that in five to 10 years, the world will look different despite the naysayers. So here's an old business model that was about to be flipped on its head that we're gonna investigate a little more fully. The first automobile insurance policies weren't actually automobile insurance policies at all. They were actually designed for horse and carts. And to give you some sense of that, they called the first cars horseless carriages. That's what they were. They were still using old ideas to, to try and understand the new ones. And the first insurance policies were designed as modified horse and buggy policies and the way that you paid your premium was based, get this, on the horsepower of the vehicle. How many horses the car was equivalent to. So it's very, you know, backward looking instead of forward looking. It's important to note that at that time, they just didn't have data about how cars would run, right? So they were still trying to understand how they could predict accidents or who knows what, right? So, okay, in the insurance business, Profit is earned when premiums exceed claims, but the margins are much smaller than you may imagine. Actuaries build risk models to accurately predict these payouts, but the old business models are tied to age, gender, years of driving experience, and where you live. They put millions of us into very generalized risk buckets. Now, historically, the lack of real-time data has meant that your premium, the premium that you pay for car insurance, something that almost all of us are faced with, has very little to do with the way that you drive and the way that you're, dr uh, or the driving conditions. And in reality, each of us is actually in very different buckets at different times. Um, even identical twins have different driving behaviors and who among us hasn't at one time or another gone from being the angel to the devil with the lead foot, you know? And that sometimes happens because you're late for an appointment or some idiot cuts you off and you have to show them who's boss or maybe you just had a traumatic breakup that morning and driving is not the first thing on your mind. So in real life, Things aren't black and white. They're constant shades of gray that change moment to moment, meter to meter. Okay, so matching risk the risk in insurance to each moment requires a level of detail in the data that until recently simply wasn't practical. Remember the Netflix story? There were some prerequisite technologies like the DVD that were needed to make that shift possible. 
Since 1998, every car produced in North America and Europe has been legally required to have a standard onboard diagnostics port that provides access to huge quantities of real-time data. That's the port they use uh, when you take your car in for servicing, for emissions testing. I bought this device on Amazon last week for a mere 70 bucks at retail price, including shipping. And with it, you can read all of the car's performance data, tracking the state of the car's systems on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Insurance companies are already using this telematics data to provide usage-based insurance policies. Most of these policies follow a carrot and stick approach, providing discounts to drivers who display good driving behavior. You know, you don't want to brake too hard or speed up too fast, right? However, the data collected remains siloed within companies. Further to this, it remains in different formats, and people aren't willing to share because, as we know, data is the new oil. Automotive companies, insurance companies, they're all interested in the same data, but they're terrified to share because they're worried they'll lose their competitive edge. They're still keeping the same model, but customers are increasingly feeling like what they're giving up is not a good deal. So what we've built here is a response. Let's get the best deal on car insurance for the end consumer using this data. The technology allows us to bring that bucket size down beyond the individual driver to a moment by moment basis. Did you say bucket? I know you love this detail, but fuck it. Let's get to the demo. <laughs> okay, so this is a proof of concept. That's what it is. This is not a production. Uh, piece of software. It is running live on the internet at insuremycar.biotosphere.com. Anybody can reach it right now. And it's a website that we've built that is tied to a vehicle in real time and not some toy vehicle, not some vehicle that will appear five or ten years from now. It's actually to my car. It's two years old and we'll be getting to that in just a moment. Now, we're taking advantage of the fact that the vehicle has an open API that is used by a variety of apps to monitor information like its location and its speed. Oh, they're calling me from the car. Hello? We'll get to them in a second, but that's the car calling. So, um, so basically, the car is able to talk to a public API. It's a Tesla Model X, and the data all gets sucked down by Tesla, and then we're not quite sure what happens with it, but Tesla is doing the same thing as many other car manufacturers, and almost every car rolling off a production line today or tomorrow is going to be connected to the internet at all times and all the manufacturers are going to be collecting their own data and all the insurance companies want that data and nobody wants to share so we're just showing you an idea of what's possible so to log in the user and this is the user the only person who has access to this data is the user needs a vehicle ID and a, an authentication key to access the information. It's important to understand that throughout this, for the proof of concept, no information about the individual person who is driving the vehicle is actually needed, stored, or retained in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, much of the data that we're relying on here isn't even related to the individual car. All right, so let's just log in to the system. And this is what we've built. All right, so you'll see at the moment, there's the car. Based on my login up at the top, it actually builds a real-time picture of the car with all the model options and the wheels and everything else. You'll see the VIN is up there. The car is currently in park. I call my vehicle Tessie. And the last time it made a payment was at about uh, 11.36. And it's currently covered by insurance. You can see where the car is located, and it's parked. Um, and because it's parked, its speed is zero, and it's being covered by our best insurance provider called Standby Insurance. Let's just switch to the insurance over here, because the big thing to understand here is we're not insuring the individual. 
This is not about who you are. It's about how the car is being driven moment to moment. All right. A car parked in a parking lot provides a lot less risk to an insurance company than a car doing 100 kilometers an hour on a road with the speed limit of 40. So the idea here is that in our proof of concept, we have three available offers. They're not three different insurance companies. They may be all from the same insurance company, or they may be hundreds of offers from different insurance companies, each willing to offer different rates for different types of driving and different kinds of risk. So standby insurance offers a really low rate when your car is parked. You're on vacation, you're not in the country for a month, you, you wouldn't want to pay a lot of money. It's like not paying to use the phone if you're not in the country. Now, when the car comes out of park, the rates go right up. We give the discount for a parked car um, from a relatively high rate when the car comes out because we can't guarantee that for this particular car, any of the other offers will be available. So there always has to be some form of coverage. But we have tortoise insurance, which offers the best rates as long as you, you're staying at a fairly slow rate. If you speed with tortoise, the penalties are really, really high, and the car may well select another provider. And in a nod to our friend Elon, who we really hope is watching today, um, we have the BF Rocket Insurance. I uh, hope some of you get that joke. Uh, where you can drive as fast as you want with no penalties. You will pay a lot more for the insurance, but um, models in which you pay people to drive really well um, really don't account for the fact that as human beings, there are times when you want to put your foot down and there are times that you want to drive well. And the carrot and stick approach generally lasts for about 30 days and then people forget they're being watched and they drive, drive like they always have. So what we're trying to do is say, drive it the way you want. And just like when you put your foot down on the pedal of a regular car and you, you're willing to pay more in gas, why wouldn't you be willing to pay more for insurance in that period where you're driving recklessly or fast. So let's go back to the vehicle usage and we'll see if, uh, Carl, are you there? The important thing to note here is that all of the insurance coverage is paid for with IOTA. The car has its own IOTA smart wallet and it's preloaded with IOTA, right? And every time we collect the data and uh, send it up to the Tangle, there is an insurance policy that is purchased. Okay, so we have, we have Carl in the, uh, in the car up at this location. Are you taking good care of my baby there, Carl? As long as you ask me to, Terry. <laughs> okay, so apparently he doesn't want to give it back. All right, so um, you'll, see, you'll see that the car is in park um, and that it's been in park for some time now, and he's paying a really low cost per minute. Now, again, it's the car that's going to make the decisions and will dynamically select which is the best policy. Uh, honesty is usually the best policy, but which is the best policy from moment to moment, meter to meter, in real time as the car is being driven. So. Um, what I'd like you to do is notice that standby insurance is running over here. And Carl, I'm going to ask you if you can put the car into drive. As you do, watch up at the top where the car is that it will go from park to drive. Let's just see if he does that. There we go. So he's now in drive. And notice the moment he did that, the, the car said, ah, the car is no longer parked. And in a non-parked situation, the best insurance provider is tortoise insurance. He's still not moving, but you'll notice that the cost suddenly uh, jumped up, even though the price, the speed, has not moved. Can you put the car in reverse for me a second? There we go. It doesn't change anything. Put it back into park. There we go. We're still paying tortoise insurance because in this particular time segment, 
you're paying based on the best offer for everything that you've done in that time segment. So let's go back into Drive, Carl. All right. By the way, um, this this panel works perfectly on the um, on the display inside the Tesla as well. All right. So we're now in Drive, but he's not moving, and so I. Uh, I'd love you to just start driving just a little, and as he does, you'll see the car will start to move, and the current speed will pick up. There he goes. So as he starts to move and we get the speed picking up, he's going to start paying, or not he, the car will start paying for insurance, and the insurance is a function both of speed and time. Now, when he goes above 20, uh, sorry, uh, 30 kilometers per hour, you will see that suddenly tortoise insurance has a penalty, and there's now a special condition so that you're paying 30% more. But we're still with tortoise. He's coming down to the lights. Um, and you'll see on the arrow there that the uh, location is being updated in real time. So in just a moment, he's going to turn right, get onto the highway, where um, against all my better judgments, we're going to invite Carl to put his foot down and see what this baby will do. Um, traffic permitting. All right. Notice when the uh, special conditions kicked in, the cost per minute rose. And you can see the speed. So you can actually see harsh acceleration, harsh braking, those kinds of things. And here he goes. When he goes above 60 kilometers, his top speed is currently 37, 47. Here we go. Oh, my God. I don't think I can bear to look. All right. It gets worse. It gets worse? Okay. So now he's gone above 60. We're now on the BFR insurance plan for this particular time segment. All right. Okay, go for it. Okay, and you'll see that the, the cost is rocketing, quite literally. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> All right, so, um, so at this point, I think we lost that. We lost the signal, although we have the sound. He's going too um, fast. <laughs> it's going too fast, yeah. We're just reconnecting to the, uh, to the video feed there. Um, but I'm, I'm going to let uh, Carl go at this point. Not from the company, just from the video stream. <laughs> All right. So we're now on BFR Rocket Insurance. Um, we're paying penalties for ludicrous speed over here. Can we uh, flip back to the... Uh, oh, there he's, st he's still on the... He's, he's going to take off for the weekend, I can tell. Um, anyway, so... Uh, we're getting all this information, and at the end of each period, based on what's happening, all of this data that's been collected, all of the information that's needed for the insurance, will be written to the IOTA Tangle as an immutable record. Now, today, data is correct, collected, and insurance companies want to keep the insurance inside their silo. The car companies want to keep the data inside their silo. Uh, but it's important to understand that every single car that's out on the road today could start using this technology tomorrow if either the manufacturers actually included this, uh, this technology at the point of manufacturing or aftermarket providers wanted to do this. But in the demonstration that we've done so far, none of this actually knows anything about the user. Now, we could always add information about the user with our palm vein scanners. But again, is it important to know who the user is or simply know that the user is licensed to drive in the jurisdiction in which the car is placed, that the user has a driving history with no claims, but we still don't need to know necessarily how much the driver weighs or you know various other things. And based on the amount of information that an individual is willing to share as part of this program, they may receive additional discounts. But it's the car that makes the decision. It's the car that's choosing the best deal. And it's the consumer who gets the best rate. 
It's the insurance company who now gets all of the data that they need as part of a collaborative lake to allow better, more informed decisions about where real risk is that are arriving in real time. All right. So uh, you know, why don't we check out one of the transactions actually to, to see how it actually exists on the IOTA tangle? Sure. Really okay. Can we get rid of Carl? I keep trying to get rid of him, but he doesn't seem to want to go away. So all of this data is stored on the tangle, encrypted, immutable. Nobody can ever change it. Um, I don't know if anybody saw, but just today in the BBC, um, it was announced that Uber uh, paid, I think it was $147 million um, for a data breach that they tried to cover up. We've seen many situations at the government levels, in large corporations, who have all said at various times, with the greatest of integrity, trust us with your data. It's safe with us. Um, and then it hasn't been. This data is stored. It's encrypted. It's immutable. Nobody can go in afterwards and change it. Um, you're not relying on the company to provide the data and never being sure whether the data they're providing is actually in its original state or not. Ultimately, it puts the control actually back with the end consumer because even when you pass on your data to the insurance broker, you will know exactly what data you're passing on to them. And there are solutions designed to help take care of privacy and security. Yeah, cool. All right, so um, if we just go back to this over here, um, you can see that we've had, in the time that we've been talking, several payments. There's one here that was with standby. This particular one was done with BF Rocket. And you can see that the data is being written in real time. And um, there are lots of things that could be done to modify this model. Today, we've kept it very, very simple. We have, you know, speed, uh, but there's lots of other data that could inform the decisions when the rest of the traffic is doing 100, represents an entirely different risk than the same driver in the same car doing 100 kilometers an hour in the middle of a snowstorm in winter at nighttime when the rest of the, the uh, traffic on the highway is doing 40. Today's models simply cannot account for that. There are all kinds of things that we can do, hard braking, hard acceleration, and basically, if you choose to identify yourself, what it is that you choose to identify with um, and how much information you're willing to provide. But again, it's just an attestation that your identity confirms that you have those attributes. It doesn't necessarily have to reveal who the person is, all right? We can talk about that more later yeah. if you the, want. The important thing to note here is that a multitude of new data features can be engineered from the oceans of data being generated by the cars, right? So risk will be sliced up and allocated dynamically into all sorts of new insurance products that can be bought on a real-time basis based on what conditions or risk context your vehicle is actually in. Cool. So... Um, our array of projects is seeking to explore all kinds of things, but um, we can go back. We can go back. <laughs> we'll go back to the invitation. So really, this is a proof of concept. It's not a production working, or it's a working model, and it works with cars that are in production today. Um, but there are so many more things that will inform how the world will change. And we would really like to invite people in the insurance business, in the uh, car manufacturing business, in government, telcos, because you're all involved in helping build all of this. And we'd like to invite developers and people who are inspired by these futures to literally come and join us here at the Biotosphere as we collectively build the future that we're all living into. We really believe that all of these voices are necessary, like a, a serious diversity of voices is necessary in order to create tomorrow's resilient standards. Cool. And we're working on other things. This is only the first project that we can talk about publicly. Um, as I said, we're working on palm vein scanning technologies. We're working uh, on solar technologies. 
A uh, lot of things that we are not at liberty to discuss at the moment. Um, each of you who arrived today had the opportunity to actually do a palm vein scan. Obviously, the people attending remotely didn't have that opportunity. Um, and in return for your palm vein scan, and no personal information whatsoever, um, each of you has the ability to claim an amount of iota that we have associated with your palm vein scan, and not even we have the ability to do it, because without your palm, we can't access that money. And we will be having a meetup soon to be announced. You'll be contacted if you're on the invitation list, where we'll show you how to download the application onto your phone. We'll actually uh, be doing some raffles, and we will um, like to engage with you and show you just a small taste of what's to come. Uh, you can see some of the areas that we're doing this in, but um, yeah, you want, to, uh, you want to talk about the ecosystem? There, there's clearly a huge array of exciting projects happening in the IOTA ecosystem at large. Uh, today in Germany, actually, the IM Pass group is debuting their identity solution, which also uses Fujitsu palm vein scanners. Uh, massive shout out as well to the IEN and the vibrant open source ecosystem. That's the IOTA Evangelist Network, for those who don't know the TLA or three-letter acronym. <laughs> And, and a big shout out, honestly, to everybody at Arup. Um, honestly, we, we could not have done this without your support. Um, you, they have been absolutely amazing. Uh, a special shout out also to all the people at the Biotosphere and at Refined Data. Frankly, we set some outrageous stretch goals. Um, they were audacious, and I have been shocked at how much people have risen, and you know who you are. Uh, particular shout out to Mike over there, who's uh, a lot of the, uh, the tech over here and has built a lot of the stuff, but nobody does this alone. Uh, we have some amazing developers. We have amazing support staff, administrators. I have never seen a more excited and more turned on, switched on group of people. Uh, thank you to Brian. Uh, thank you to my business partner, Hugh. And thank you to my wife and family who will need a palm vein scan because they will not recognize the person who walks back in the door tonight. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a ride. Um, and thank you. Yeah, thank one, you. One final thank you as well to Cosette and Yuko for organizing this amazing event and helping the broader business and startup community build collaborative ties. Valerie, yourself, and Janice, seriously, thank you. It's been great. Yeah. Okay, so cool. with that... Questions and answers. Now, you may have more questions than we have answers for, and that's just fine. But everything's open. Everything's possible. <clears throat> we have a lot of people watching remotely as well. So if there are questions uh, that have come in on the chat, um, guys, please feel free to, oh, you have some questions uh, that have come in remotely, and we'll do our best to answer them, or at very least get back to you with a credible response. Yes. Um, so it's a great question. Um, there are many things that lead to behavioral changes. Sometimes they're imposed by government agencies, by regulation. Sometimes they're, they're pulled by consumers who start demanding things. Um, you know, our Netflix model, I think, is a perfect example of an old world com company um, who said, we don't need to worry about this because the old way of doing things will continue to work until somebody ate their lunch. Astoundingly, Netflix was offered to Best Buy, uh, to uh, Blockbuster, and they, they turned it down. They didn't think it was going to work. So it will be a combination of all these things, but you're already seeing that the cars have this capability, and if insurance companies see a competitive edge, they will leap to offer innovative products, 
And as consumers start adopting those and they see the benefits without seeing it as a some sort of Faustian deal where they've sold their data to the devil in exchange for some, you know, points or, you know, a 10% discount, but they realize that what they've given up is worth much more than what they've got. Um, they will look for systems that protect their identity, pre protect their data, or at the very least give them the choice of enjoying the benefits, the real benefits of what that data is worth. Um, once the first people get on board, everybody else is playing catch up. So getting a boulder moving is really tough. Once it starts moving, it's really hard to stop it. D does that? I, I think I have some points too. I think okay. for, in my uh, perspective, I think the insurers, the car manufacturers as well, everybody wants more fine grain access to the data. Like you, you will get access to way more data if everybody shares within the data lake, for example. You can build better risk models that will drive your costs down. Uh, further to that, you don't have to worry about your, like, your data completely being stolen, for example. There are yeah. ways to broker the data, so. I, I'm it. not gonna say to you that we have all of the answers, but that's why we are really encouraging governments, consumers, developers, agencies, uh, insurance companies to join with this and actually design what this future looks like so everybody wins. But to the point that I made earlier around, uh, you know, the old adversarial models, everybody's interested in your data you know, today, and we're already seeing some of the abuses of that. We're envisioning a collaborative model where everybody wins instead of there being black and white winners and losers. So, um, yeah. Yes. Uh, we have built a, bit, a proof of concept. This is not a product. We haven't built a product that we're we're trying to sell to anybody. This is a proof of possibility that exists today, not at some fuzzy period in the future. If all the parties wanted to come together, we could actually start offering this, but we're building the, the foundation. The, the loyalty points or the incentives or the rewards are up to the insurance companies, and the, the, they, these are driven by market forces. That's not what we're out to do. We're creating at the biotosphere this self-sustaining ecosystem where we make the impossible possible a lot sooner than it might otherwise be and you know, help us make that dream come true. I, I think one interesting way to include loyalty programs is incentivizing further data to be submitted from the consumer standpoint, right? So if you have a long track record of good driving and whatever, obviously you wanna keep that going, you wanna share that, with the insurance provider, but the insurance providers could use some sort of incentivization loyalty program to pull more data from the consumer, for example. Right. I just want to make sure that the consumer has the choice and that people aren't giving up the milk cow for a handful of magic beans. All right, good. Anybody, yes? Well, first of all, can I tell everybody at home, don't become an actuary? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to I'm just going to stop. Can we get a microphone to people when they're speaking just so that everybody can hear the question? It would be great because it's a good question. Thank you. Actuaries perform a service of providing historical information linked to as you said, um age, um, you know, even sex and 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 wh whatever, but there at the onset there won't will there be enough data for an insurance company to be able to price. It's just because somebody drives at the speed limit does not necessarily mean they won't crash versus somebody who, let's say, speeds but is a very good driver. So like, how, how will insurance companies know how to price and how to, uh, um, the, pr your, you know, the, the way, uh, the inf data that you're going to be giving them? Th they, they won't. But I promise you that if there's a need, yes. they will find a way. Okay. And I'm not an insurance Yes. company. Yes. I'm not an actuary. And I probably don't know as much about insurance as I should, but we'd love to talk to people who do have those answers right. and engage with them. But I promise you, as with you know, all new technologies, mm. the way will be found. They didn't know how to price insurance for cars when they came out. 
we'll all be either driving autonomous cars or semi-autonomous cars or sharing cars. These models are all going to change. The world has to change with it. I think this is also tying into the general societal trend of you know deep learning, big AI. With an open data exchange, suddenly actuaries can dive deeper, look for new data features, figure out their training process, and that can be tied into the technology as well, right? So they can kind of tier how they launch new models, how that like the pricing affects their business model, et cetera. Cool. All right. Yeah, maybe we can take some, some remote questions because a lot of people have waited a long time yes, to see some of this stuff. Is my mic working? Yeah, it is oh, working, yeah. So um, I'm This is Jessa. Hi, yeah. I'm Jessa. <laughs> nice to meet you. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Yannick Nalison. Okay, just, just ask yeah, the question. Sure. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on your relationship with the IOTA Foundation? Uh, do you have regular meetings? Are you in close contact? Ah, uh, the uh, million IOTA question. Um, <laughs> 64 million IOTA question. Um, so we work very closely with the IOTA Foundation. This proof of concept is something that they are fully aware of, that they have seen, that they are as excited about as we are, but we are not the IOTA Foundation, um, but we do work collaboratively very closely. And um, we talked about the boulder getting moving. They're there at our side. They're helping. We're helping them. Again, it's very collaborative. We speak on a regular basis. Uh, we believe that we only win when everybody wins, and I think they feel the same way. Awesome. All right? Yeah, we have a couple more. Okay, go know. for it quickly, All and right. then we'll take uh, a couple more. I don't know how much time we have left. Is this possible with motorcycles? This is possible with anything. I mean, this is a model for a moving vehicle. It doesn't really matter if it's a truck, a motorcycle, a bicycle, or a scooter. I, it doesn't really matter. And these models are just examples of some of the ways that this technology can be used to change old business models and make new possibilities available to all of us. So again, if people have other ideas, come forward, we would love to hear from you um, either today or send information in through the chat on the live stream. We have the Biotosphere website. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not hard to find and we'd love you to find us. Speaking further to that, I believe also, you know, with car sharing, autonomous vehicles, fleet management, it's not just the type of vehicle, it's the context it's in, right? And all of the contexts could use a foundational layer like this to make sure that the data is transacted in a secure way both ways. Fantastic. Cool. All right, let's take a couple from the audience here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let's get the mic over there. Yep. Um, the technology itself is really interesting, but uh, and we've talked, you've talked about a lot of data sharing and how it will help us in the future. However, for the customers to actually even consider this, there has to be a huge price incentive like cost incentive for us to save money and share data with you. So on average right now, what are your projections in cost savings for end users? So I, I'm, I'm going to answer that. I have no idea. I'm not an insurance company. I can tell you that just like, you know, Netflix was founded by a guy who didn't set out to found Netflix. He just got outraged by the amount of money he had to pay in late fees one day, and it triggered a change. And look where we've come. But he, he offered yeah. convenience yes. for the good price. Okay, there will so, be yeah. So, so usage-based insurance right now already uh, rewards good drivers like 10 to 25 percent on average. But those policies you're locked into for like a month or a year or whatever, and you have like a trial period, right? So you also have companies like lowest rates or like price aggregators who are taking this from like a big data analytics perspective. We're just trying to combine those with also like dynamic robovisor buying. Seems like it'll make sense. And, and just to add to that, I, I can only speak for myself. I don't know you, we've never met, so I, I'm not there when you're browsing on the internet. But the amount of time that people certainly myself, will invest in searching for the best price. Sometimes tiny amounts of money between different providers is incredible. If you believe that your car can dynamically do that work while you're sleeping, while you're driving, and it's always getting you the best deal, 
then the insurance companies will be competing with each other. And we are taking huge amounts of cost out of the system for them because they have to take all the claims data and associate it with all these other conditions that they really don't know a great deal about. The market will drive that, but I believe that this could result in significant advantages for some people. You know, if I go to Florida for a month, why should I be paying huge amounts of insurance for a risk that the insurance company doesn't have? And yet at the same time, if I want to drive like a maniac, some of them actually we encountered on our way down here today, and they won't care about how much they're spending because they just want to get where they're going on time and they don't care about anybody else. I believe everybody will win here. Right. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. We need one of those tossable mics so we can, yeah. I also yeah. have a cold, so that That's okay. <laughs> Um, so I guess insurance is just one application, and um, so I'm just wondering, are there other um, applications models you possibly have in mind? Um, I mean, if you can share data, it might be possible to share electricity consumption and then um, kind of also determine when what? electricity Brilliant. is cheapest and whatever. Br Brilliant. And these are the very projects that IOTA is being used for globally. This is not the biotosphere. This is IOTA as a protocol layer on which people will build all kinds of things in a world in which we all get to control our data, but we also get to choose what to share. And machines will talk to machines. And I'm guessing you haven't seen the 100 billion reasons why video yet. No. So there's a lot of stuff about this. This is just the first of many projects that we're working on, but there are hundreds of projects around the globe, including with large organizations like the United Nations and VW and Fujitsu and Robert Bosch. Um, we are not alone. We're just trying to do our part in the much bigger picture. We have two more minutes, so... Um, just, just to speak to that like yes. a little bit, uh, one of the benefits of having kind of an open collaborative data lake is that suddenly there may be interested parties from outside of what you would think of as like the one industry vertical. So like say you had camera data from the car, right? Like you could use that to detect potholes or something. Then you could send like predictive maintenance there. there this is like a long tail of possibilities. Yeah. We, we have an hour. This is like a one week conversation once you get us started. So, but thank you, it was a great question. All right. Last question, and then I think we have to uh, cut it up. Um, thank you to all the people who have been here uh, remotely, who've joined us. Um, as I say, we will be staying around here uh, to answer some additional questions afterwards, if you'd like. I know many of you have other appointments that you have to get to, so we appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, thank you to everybody who's tuned in. We will also be uh, sharing some of this information uh, subsequently, so uh, do we have time for one more? Yes, no? Yeah, all right, let's go for it. Bucket. Uh, yeah, yes, no? We have some online. Okay. No? Okay. Oh, there's another one. Quick. If you're hiring uh, project managers, how do we get in touch with you? Uh, Biotosphere.com. <laughs> Send your project management application. Listen, you can't build Rome alone, all right? It's going to take a team. It's going to take a community. We have to stop thinking, you know, in our little silos. We all share this planet together, uh, but we're going to have to fix the problems and create the future together. So I thank you all. I uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation, and thank you to everybody around the world listening in. Thank you. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs>